A very good morning aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis session by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 16th of January 2022. These are the list of topics we will be discussing today. Without wasting time, let us start today's discussion. Today, as a part of previous year mains question discussion, we will be discussing a question from 2019 General Studies Paper 3. Now, let us start our discussion. Look at the question here. Let me read out the question first. Elaborate the policy taken by the government of India to meet the challenges of the food processing sector. Here the key word or the directive word is elaborate. When the key word is elaborate, what you have to do is give more information or details relating to the statement given in the question. There is no need to analyze anything here. We have to convince the evaluator that we are updated and know stuff about the question asked. So here, in reference to this question, we must state all the recent policy measures taken by the government to support the food processing sector. See, the question here is a very direct question and everyone will be able to write a convincing answer. So, to get more marks than your fellow competitors, you have to make your structuring attractive. This will differentiate your answer and give you an edge. Okay. Now, coming to the introduction part. What to write in the introduction for this question? We know that food processing sector is a sunrise sector. Sunrise sector is a sector that is new or relatively new and it is growing at a fast rate and it is expected to be an important sector in the future. So in the introduction you can mention the potential of the food processing sector industry. You can mention about the role that food processing industry will play in achieving the government's target of doubling farmers income by 2022 and becoming a 5 trillion dollar economy by 2024. You can mention the employment potential of the industry. This sector is alone expected to generate 9 million jobs by 2024. You can also add other data relating to the food processing sector in India in the introduction. See, according to the India Brand Equity Foundation, the food processing sector in India is expected to reach $535 billion by 2025-26. The Indian food industry is expanding at a compounded annual growth rate of 11% and the food processing sector accounts for 32% of the total food industry. India's food industry attracted $4.18 billion in foreign direct investment between April 2014 and March 2020. You can also mention other benefits of the food processing sector like its role in reducing malnutrition, reducing food wastage, reducing food inflation, promoting crop diversification and curbing rural to urban migration. You can mention the points we discussed now in your introduction or you can add other good data in your introduction. That is up to you. Now having addressed the introduction, let us move to the body of the answer. See, since the question here asks about the policy taken by the government to address challenges of the food processing sector, I am going to structure my answer like this. I am not going to just list out the steps taken by the government. Instead, I am going to write a challenge faced by the sector and then list out the government policies to address the challenge. The thing I will give more importance here is the policy measure aspect than on the challenge aspect since the question asks us to elaborate on the policy taken by the government. Now imagine you are planning to start a food processing industry. The first hurdle you will face is the lack of access to credit. To address this challenge, the Ministry of Finance has set up a special fund of rupees 2000 crore in NABARD for providing direct term loan at affordable rates of interest to designated food parks and food processing units in the designated food parks. In addition to this, under the Pradhan Mandri Kisan Sampatha Yojana, capital subsidy in the form of granting aids ranging from 35% to 75% to the eligible project cost subject to maximum specified limit is provided to investors under various schemes for undertaking infrastructure, logistic projects and setting up of food processing units in the country. Now moving on to the next challenge. Now using the loan given by the government you have set up a food processing unit. The next challenge we will face is in terms of infrastructure. You are facing difficulty in your ability to purchase raw materials from your vendors in villages due to lack of road connectivity. Even if you manage to purchase your raw material, most of the raw material are lost during transport due to lack of cold storage facilities. To address these challenges, under the Pradhan Mandri Kisan Sampatha Yojana, there are two subcomponents. The first one is Mega Food Park Scheme. This is based on the hub and spokes model. The hub being Mega Food Park and the spokes are the transportation networks connecting the Mega Food Park to the raw material producing areas. 
the efficient transportation network will bring down the transportation cost and the transportation time. It will also minimize wastage. The next subcomponent is the scheme of cold chain value addition and preservation infrastructure. The objective of the scheme of cold chain value addition preservation infrastructure is to provide integrated cold chain and preservation infrastructure facilities without any break from the farm gate to the consumer. It covers creation of infrastructure facility along the entire supply chain from pre-cooling, weighing, sorting, grading, waxing facility at farm level, multi-product and multi-temperature cold storage, packaging facility, blast freezing facility in the distribution hub, mobile cooling units for facilitating distribution of horticulture, organics produce, marine, dairy, meat and poultry produce etc. Now moving on to the next challenge. So you have now started the food processing unit using the fund given by the government and the government through infrastructure has connected your unit with your supplier. But for your food processing unit to function properly, you need skilled workforce. This is the next challenge, the lack of proper skilled workforce. To address this challenge, let us see what measures that the government has taken. The Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampatha Yojana of the Ministry of Food Processing Industries has a skill development component to it. This subcomponent of Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampatha Yojana aims to provide sector specific skilled workforce from floor level workers, operators, packagers and assembly line workers to quality control supervisors etc in various segments of the food processing industries. The Ministry of Food Processing Industries is working in close collaboration with other related agencies to augment skilled manpower in the food processing sector. The ministry is collaborating with the Food Industry Capacity and Skill Initiative, the Sector Skill Council in Food Processing for validation of quality packs for identified job roles and developing course curriculum for food processing sector through the National Institute of Food Technology Entrepreneurship and Management that is NIFTEM. See, the ministry has established the National Institute of Food Technology, Entrepreneurship and Management in Kundili in Sonipet, Haryana. The NIFTEM has been declared a deemed university. It is running a B.Tech, M.Tech and Ph.D. courses and undertakes R&D projects in the area of food technology. Funds have been allocated to the institute to promote research activity, expand village adoption program and skill development in the food processing sector. In addition to this, the ministry has also established the Indian Institute of Food Processing Technology in Tanjavur, Tamil Nadu. This institute also works towards developing skilled manpower. Now you have got your food processing unit set up and running with skilled manpower created using the efforts of Ministry of Food Processing Industry. You have started producing. You are planning to export the goods you have produced to Europe. But people in Europe are not ready to buy your product due to lack of quality certification. This will be your next challenge. To address this our government has taken the following initiative. That is the food safety and the quality assurance infrastructure scheme. This is a subcomponent under Pradhan Mandri Kisan Sampatha Yojana. See, quality and food safety has become a competitive edge in the global market for food products. So, the subcomponent aims to help in all-round development of food processing sector in the country through various aspects of total quality management such as quality control, quality system and quality assurance which would be developed in a horizontal fashion. This food safety and quality assurance infrastructure scheme has two programs under it. The first one is setting up or upgrading food testing laboratories program. Under this, a network of food testing and analysis laboratories will be established. This network will act as a surveillance system and also for a timely analysis of samples and ensure compliance of international and domestic standards on food in case of exports as well as imports. The next program is HACCP ISO standards food safety or quality management systems program. HACCP ISO standards are necessary conditions for improving the overall quality of food safety and hygiene in the country and also to increase India's share in global food trade. Here HACCP that is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point is a tool to assess hazards and establish control system that focus on prevention rather than relying mainly on the end product testing. HACCP is a internationally recognized method of identifying and managing food safety related risk. See, under this program, grantee aid is given in the form of reimbursement of expenditure towards implementation of HACCP or ISO standards at the rate of 50% in general area and at the rate of 75% in northeastern region. 
okay now coming back you have produced your product use the network of testing lab to certify your product with iso standard or the hacccp certification now you can export your product to europe to improve your market further you are planning to sell your product in the domestic market also here again comes the problem of infrastructure in terms of inefficient forward linkages to address this challenge there is the scheme for creation of forward and backward linkages which is also a sub component under pradhan mandri kisan sampatha yojana here to improve forward linkages a retail chain of outlets including facilities such as frozen storage deep freezers refrigerated display cabinets cold rooms chillers packing and packaging etc in addition to this distribution center associated with the retail chains of outlets with facilities like cold room cold storage ripening chamber okay this will address the challenge of forward linkages now using the government credit you have established your food processing unit government policy has ensured you with good infrastructure connectivity cold storage chain institution to provide you with high quality manpower network of food labs subsidy to get your product certified and finally forward linkages to improve your domestic footprint now you have a well established food processing unit to improve your unit further you will have to do research and development this is your next challenge our government has a scheme for this too here the ministry of food processing industries has been extending financial assistance to undertake demand driven research and development work for the benefit of food processing industry in terms of product and process development efficient technology improved packing value addition etc with commercial value finally to provide incentive to help you produce more from your food processing unit the government has launched another initiative recently the union cabinet announced the production linked incentive scheme for the food processing industries see this is a central sector scheme this scheme aims to boost domestic manufacturing and cut down on import bills the production linked incentive scheme aims to give companies incentives on incremental sales from products manufactured in domestic units apart from inviting foreign companies to set up shop in india the scheme also aims to encourage local companies to set up or expand existing manufacturing units the scheme will be monitored at the center by the import group of secretaries chaired by the cabinet secretary in addition to all the above challenges there is another challenge that the food processing sector faces most of the food processing unit in india are in the informal sector the unorganized food processing sector comprising nearly 25 lakh units contributes to 75% of employment in the food processing sector nearly 66% of these units are located in rural area and about 80% of them are family based enterprises supporting livelihood of rural households these units largely fall within the category of micro enterprises the unorganized food processing sector faces a number of challenges which limit their performance and their growth the challenges include lack of access to modern technology or equipment lack of access to training lack of access to institutional credit lack of basic awareness on quality control on products and lack of branding and marketing skills to address this the ministry of food processing industry launched the pradhan mantri formalization of micro food processing enterprises scheme as a part of atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan this scheme will provide support for capital investment for upgradation and formalization with registration for gst fss ai hygiene standards and udyog aadhar the scheme will provide capacity building through skill training imparting technical knowledge on food safety and quality improvement the scheme will also provide hand holding support for availing bank loans and for upgrading the technology finally the scheme will provide support to former producer organizations self help groups producers cooperatives for providing them with capital investment common infrastructure branding and marketing now in this discussion we saw the challenges faced by the food processing sector and the initiatives taken by the government to address the challenges see instead of just dictating you the answer i have followed a different approach today i have put you guys in the position of the entrepreneur wishing to start a food processing unit the challenge you will face as a result of this and finally the various policy measures that the government has taken to address these challenges that you might face while doing so we have developed a holistic and a structured answer for today's question see i used this method while writing mains answer to generate points and to structure my answer i hope you found this method of mine useful if not no problem you can have your own method of generating points anyways 
I have discussed various challenges and the associated policy reforms of the government. Like I already mentioned, since the question asks, elaborate the policy taken by the government of India, in your answer, focus more on the policy part and less on the challenges part. Now, coming to the conclusion. Here you can mention the potential of the food processing sector to lift millions out of poverty and malnutrition. You can say that the government recognizing the importance of the food processing sector has allowed 100% foreign direct investment in food processing through automatic route. You can also mention about the draft food processing policy. Okay, I hope this session was useful. If you have any suggestions regarding today's main question discussion, post them in the comment section. It will help me make some course corrections. Okay, with this let us conclude the previous year mains question discussion session. Now let us move on to the news article discussion session. Take a look at this FAQ article here. This is the first article we will be discussing today. It talks about the verdict of WTO's dispute settlement panel. The panel ruled that India is breaking rules framed under the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff that is GATT by subsidizing sugar producers. So what has India done? India has filed an appeal with the appellate body of the WTO against the verdict given by the dispute settlement panel. This is the essence of the article given here. In this article discussion, let us understand about the dispute briefly and we will see what is the WTO mechanism in relation to subsidies. And finally, we shall end the discussion by glancing through the support given by the Indian government to sugar producers. And before that, the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here. Just go through it. Now, let us start our discussion. First of all, let us see the dispute. See, in 2019, Australia, Brazil and Guatemala Guatemala is a country in Central America. See, these countries complained about India in the WTO. They argued that subsidies provided by the Indian government to sugar producers are against the rules governing international trade. See, it is very important to understand why these countries made a complaint against India. Take a look at this image here. Countries like India, Brazil, Australia and Guatemala, they are the major sugar producing countries in the world. So, they fear that India's intervention will be detrimental to the sugar market. Okay. And moreover, all the WTO members have trade rules regarding agricultural subsidies. And based on these rules only, they argued that the subsidies provided by India, which include both domestic subsidies as well as export subsidies, exceeded the limits imposed by the WTO under the trade rules. Having said that, we will see what are those WTO rules. See, in WTO terminology, subsidies in general are identified by boxes, which are given the colors of traffic light, like green, amber and red. In agriculture, it is a bit different. The agreement on agriculture has no red box. Instead, it has a blue box and a special and differential treatment box or the development box. In this discussion, we will see about amber box, which is relevant here. See, for more detailed discussion regarding the agreement on agriculture, refer to Keetana Ma'am's 17th December 2021 discussion. There, she explained every aspect of agreement on agriculture in a very detailed manner. Okay, now back to our discussion. What is this amber box subsidy? See, nearly all domestic support mechanisms considered to distort production and trade falls into the amber box category. This include subsidies directly related to production quantities, but these support are subjected to limits. Their threshold is generally 5% of the value of agricultural production for developed countries and 10% of the value of agricultural production for developing countries. So according to WTO rules, subsidies provided by India cannot exceed 10% of the total value of sugar production. As a result, the countries that we saw like Australia, Guatemala and Brazil had made a complaint against India believing that the subsidies offered by India has breached the 10% limit and this has led to increased production of sugar and this in turn has caused the global sugar prices to drop significantly. Okay, So after inquiring this complaint, WTO ruled in December that India's sugar policy was favoring domestic producers through subsidies to the disadvantage of foreign producers. In the verdict, the panel recommended that India withdraw its alleged prohibited subsidies under the production assistance, buffer stock and the marketing and transportation scheme within 120 days. So what is India's stand on this? See, India has stated that WTO's dispute panel ruling has made certain incorrect findings about domestic schemes of India. 
India has argued at the WTO that it does not offer direct subsidy to sugarcane farmers and thus does not break any international trade rules. Now let us see some of the supports provided by the Indian government to sugarcane farmers and the sugar mills. See, the central and the state government in India mandate the minimum price or the fair and remunerative price at which the sugar mills can buy sugar cane from the farmers. In fact, in August last year, the center set the fair and remunerative price at Rs. 290 per quintal for sugar for the season of 2021 to 2022. See, one quintal is equal to 100 kgs. Rs. 290 per quintal is the highest ever fair and remunerative price for sugarcane procurement. See, in addition to that, individual states also set minimum procurement price that may be higher than center's price to adjust to the local conditions. The highest procurement price for sugarcane set by the government is believed to have led to a supply surplus. This in turn has caused the sugar prices to drop. So, to help the sugar sector, the center has mandated the compulsory blending of ethanol derived from sugarcane with fuels such as petrol. According to the food ministry, the country's sugar production is likely to remain flat at 30 million tons in the next season as more sugarcane will be diverted for ethanol making. The state governments and the center have also regularly intervened to reduce the debt burden of the sugar mills also. See, recently, the center has mandated to restructure loans worth 3,000 crores offered to sugar mills by the Sugar Development Fund. See, without such assistance, it may not be possible for sugar mills to procure sugar cane from farmers at the minimum prices fixed by the government. Further, the center also regularly sanctions fund to encourage sugar mills to export sugar depending on sugar prices in the global market. In the recent budget, the center allocated Rs. 3,500 crores to fund the export of 6 million tons of sugar. See, these measures are justified because India is the second largest sugar producer in the world after Brazil. And it is estimated that more than 5 crore people depend on the cultivation of sugar cane alone for their livelihood. See, compare this to IT sector. See, IT sector provides employment only to 40 lakh people in India. So, sugar cane production is an important part of Indian economy. Okay. So, what has India done? India has appealed to the appellate body. That is the WTO appellate body. The WTO appellate body's decision will be considered final on the dispute. In case India refuses to comply with the decision, it may have to face retaliatory action from other countries. This retaliatory action could be in the form of additional tariff on Indian export and other stringent measures. So, we have to wait and see what the decision of the WTO's appellate body will be. Okay. With this, we have come to the end of the article discussion. See, in this segment, we saw about India WTO dispute regarding sugarcane, what is India's position regarding the issue, and finally, we saw the steps taken by the Indian government to support sugar cultivators and the sugar mills. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article. This article says that on January 7th, a 70-year-old man from the United States has become the first person to receive a heart transplant from a genetically modified pig. In this context, we will learn about xenotransplantation, gene editing and the ethical issues surrounding it. The syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for a reference. Just go through it. Now, let us start our discussion. See, first of all, what is xenotransplantation? Xenotransplantation is any procedure that involves the transplantation, implantation or infusion into a human recipient of either A. Live cells tissues or organs from a non-human animal source or b human body fluids cells tissues or organs that have had xyo contact with live non-human animal cells tissues or organs simply put xenotransplantation involves the transplantation of non-human tissues or organs that is pig in this case to replace an injured part of human recipient look at this picture to understand xenotransplantation first the pig cell is genetically altered. Then, these genetically modified pigs are raised in a controlled environment. Then, the organs of the pigs are removed to transplant to humans. And why are pigs chosen for xenotransplantation? See, pigs are preferred because they mature very quickly. They produce very large litters. And they have 
organs of comparable size and functions to human organs in both infancy and adulthood. They also can be bred into high health standards in microbiologically controlled environments. Pigs have been preferred as ideal candidates for xenotransplantation despite their immune system being different from humans for the simple reasons that organs are anatomically similar to those of humans. But it is not done that easily because human immune system rejects anything that is foreign whether it is from another person who is immunologically matched to the recipient or from a another species such as pig. So the scientists had to tweak the pig genome to make the organs less likely to be rejected. According to the New Scientist magazine, Revivicar, a US based company is raising a small herd of genetically engineered pigs. These pigs have 10 of their genes genetically modified to reduce the possibility of immuno rejection in the recipient. Now, how are these genes modified? See, these genes are modified using gene editing techniques. See, genome editing, also called as gene editing, is a group of technologies that give scientists the ability to change an organism's DNA. These technologies allow genetic material to be added, removed or altered in particular location in the genome. Several approaches to gene editing have been developed. A recent one being CRISPR-Cas9. See, the CRISPR-Cas9 system has generated a lot of excitement in the scientific community because it is faster, cheaper, accurate and more efficient than other existing genome editing methods. We will see about CRISPR-Cas9 brief here. See, CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindrome Repeats. They are patterns of DNA sequence found in the genomes of bacteria and other microorganisms. See, if a virus threatens a bacteria, the bacteria uses the CRISPR immune system to identify and destroy the viral genome. See, scientists have adopted this system to use in cells from animals and now in humans also. And Cas9 here is an enzyme that works like a pair of molecular scissors. A guide molecule is programmed to tell the enzyme where exactly to cut in the DNA sequence. Look at this image to understand the working of CRISPR-Cas9 system. See, a small piece of guide molecule attaches or binds to a specific target sequence of DNA in the genome. It is used to recognize the target DNA sequence and the Cas9 enzyme cuts the DNA at the targeted location. Once the DNA is cut, it is replaced with a healthy copy. This is all about CRISPR-Cas9. Now back to our discussion about xenotransplantation. What is the need for xenotransplantation? See, the development of xenotransplantation is driven by the fact that the demand for human organs for clinical transplantation far exceeds the supply of human organs. See, last year nearly 4000 people in US received donor hearts. But the need is far more. The highest demand for human organs is in case of kidneys. See, according to health ministry, around 1,80,000 people in India are estimated to suffer from renal failure every year. But only 6,000 renal transplants are carried out in the country. In addition to that, around 25 to 30,000 liver transplants are needed annually in India, but only 1,500 transplants are actually performed. Now, in case of heart, 50,000 people suffer from heart failure and are in need of heart transplant and yet only 10 to 15 heart transplants are carried out in India each year. See, harvesting organs from genetically engineered pigs is a viable alternative to meet this organ shortage. Though xenotransplantation is a lifesaver in most of the cases, it has many ethical concerns also. Let us see them one by one. The first one is animal rights. See, the animal rights groups such as People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, that is PETA, has condemned this pig heart transplantation as unethical, dangerous and a tremendous waste of public resources. Many campaigners say that it is wrong to modify the genes of animals to make them more like humans. See, the pig's heart had to be removed during the operation. So, the activists argue that the animal also have a right to live. They also argue that it has a right to live without being genetically manipulated with all the pain and trauma this entails only to be killed and their organs to be harvested. The second ethical concern is in case of religion. See, the Jewish and the Islamic law forbids them from raising or eating pigs. But some argue that receiving a pig heart to save a life is not in any way violation of their religious law. See, these are some ethical concerns regarding xenotransplantation. 
the opposers to xenotransplantation argue that instead of xenotransplantation more awareness must be generated to encourage human organ donation so that the demand supply gap in case of organ donation can be addressed so this is all regarding this article in this segment we discussed about the basics of xenotransplantation then we saw about the basics of gene editing and the crispr cas9 technology then we saw about the need for xenotransplantation and finally we saw about the ethical concerns surrounding xenotransplantation with this let us conclude our discussion okay now we will move on to the next news article this news article is with reference to the newly revised guidelines released by the union ministry of power to be specific these guidelines here is about the charging infrastructure for electric vehicles see these standards were released to enable faster adoption of electric vehicle by guaranteeing a safe reliable and affordable charging infrastructure so in this context we will see in brief about the newly revised guidelines the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here just go through it now let us start our discussion first let us have a basic understanding about electric vehicle and some of its features see a convention vehicle will have a internal combustion engine okay normally such a internal combustion engine gains its energy from the heat released during the combustion of fuel in the combustion chamber such engines usually emit carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and which in turn results in global warming okay now contrast this with the electric vehicle see electric vehicle is a vehicle that uses one or more electric motors for propulsion here propulsion is the power that moves something in a forward direction so in order to propel a electric vehicle it uses electric motors electric vehicle not only includes road and rail vehicles they also include surface and underwater vessels electric aircrafts and even electric spacecrafts okay now let us see some major classification of electric vehicles see there are three main types of electric vehicles namely hybrid plug in hybrid and battery electric vehicles both the hybrid and plug in hybrid have both the electric motor and a combustion engine which works together to generate power and propel your car but the difference here is that hybrid vehicle does not require a external power source connection here the source of power for hybrid vehicles are internal they feature regenerative braking so that even when you apply brake a generator generates electricity that is stored in the battery for later use now in case of plug in hybrids they feature a large battery these battery are charged using a electric outlet for longer electric only driving now in case of battery electric vehicle the entire energy requirement is derived only from the battery without the assistance of another engine such as fuel cell or internal combustion engine remember in both the cases that is in both the plug in hybrid and battery electric vehicles charging of the battery requires an external power source connection see these are the three main types of electric vehicle in market now let us see the newly revised guidelines regarding charging infrastructure released by the union ministry of power firstly the guidelines allows an individual or a entity to set up charging stations without a license if they meet the technical safety and performance standards see this step was taken to ensure ease of doing business here in this image you can see the location of the various charging stations this is one of the biggest problem faced by the consumer and from the seller side getting license to set up stations itself is difficult so in order to solve this issue the ministry has announced this step secondly the guidelines allow electric vehicle owners to charge their vehicles using their existing energy connections at home or at work this also does not require a license that is an individual can set up a small infrastructure in their home or office without a license for charging their electric vehicle now thirdly the guidelines made technology neutral by including not just existing international charging standards but also new indian standards so that there will not be any problem of compliance now fourthly to address the challenge of making a charging station financially viable in the period of growth of electric vehicle a revenue sharing model has been put in place for land used for the same in case of a government entity government land will be provided and the revenue sharing basis for the station will be at a fixed rate of rupees 1 per kilowatt hour this will reduce the input cost apart from this until march 31 2025 the pricing for supplying electricity to public electric vehicle charging station will be a single part tariff that does not exceed average cost of supply 
the tariff for domestic charging will also be equal to the tariff for home consumption. See, these guidelines empower the state government to fix the ceiling for service charges also. Before concluding, see in this segment we got a basic understanding about electric vehicle, different types of electric vehicles and finally the newly revised guidelines regarding charging infrastructure released by the Union Ministry of Power. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. See this photo feature here. It shows different images of food available to different community of people. See this image here. It shows two children eating jackfruit. It is the main forest produce that the Coned tribe eat. In addition to this, the news article talks about global hunger index and the hunger category of India. So, this is the crux of the article. In this context, let us see some important points regarding global hunger index from film's perspective. First of all, let us see about global hunger index. The global hunger index is a tool designed to comprehensively measure and track hunger at global, regional and national levels. It is jointly published by Concern Worldwide and Wealth Hunger Health, a German non-governmental organization. The global hunger index scores are calculated each year to assess the progress and setbacks in combating hunger. The global hunger index is designed to raise awareness and to understand the struggle behind hunger. See, this index provides a way to compare levels of hunger between countries and regions. In addition to this, it calls attention to those areas of the world where hunger levels are highest and where the need to address efforts to eliminate hunger is greatest. Now, let us see what are all the things the index measures. For each country, the values are determined based on four indicators. Firstly, undernourishment. See, undernourishment means the share of population that is undernourished. That is, the share of population whose calorific intake is insufficient. Secondly, it measures child wasting. See, child wasting is a share of children under the age of 5 who are wasted. That is, who have low weight for their height, reflecting acute undernutrition. Thirdly, it measures child stunting. See, child stunting is the share of children under the age of 5 who are stunted. That is, who have low height for their age, reflecting chronic undernutrition. Finally, it measures child mortality. Child mortality is the mortality rate of children under the age of 5. This, in part, reflects the fatal mix of inadequate nutrition and unhealthy environments. So, firstly, these measured values are calculated. And secondly, each of the four component indicators are given a standardized score on a 100 point scale. And finally, the standardized scores are aggregated to calculate the global hunger index score for each country with each of the three dimensions that is inadequate food supply, child mortality and child undernutrition. You can refer to the image here for better understanding. Now let us see India's position in the rank. In 2021 global hunger index, India ranked 101st out of 116 countries participating. With the score of 27.5, India has a hunger level that is serious. Okay. See, this image shows the trend of global hunger index score for India over the years. And this image shows the trend of various indicator values in India. This is undernourishment, child stunting, child wasting and mortality. From this graph, you can understand that the under 5 mortality and the prevalence of under 5 stunting has been declining in the past few years. While the proportion of undernourishment and the prevalence of under 5 wasting has been rising. So, to improve India's ranking in the global hunger index, government must focus more on addressing insufficient calorific intake and acute undernutrition. Now, coming back to the article, see, generally, the hunger problem can be elevated by the pandemic. People who used to go for work as migrant wage laborers are now stuck in their villages. People living in villages in the forest cannot do farming in the forest land. The constant state of hunger had led to different morbidities and subsequent mortalities in worst condition. Adding to this, poverty remains a grave concern in India. Food inadequacy and hard and hazardous work condition lead to disease such as tuberculosis, silicosis, and these diseases often lead to deaths. See, experts with extensive field experience say that this is a state of slow starvation. See, slow starvation is nothing but a condition where people do not get enough nutritious food for a long period of time 
which results in their health taking a downward slide. In most cases, health effects of slow starvation cannot be reversed. Another problem with slow starvation is that it is not properly reported. See, in case of deaths due to slow starvation, such deaths are usually tagged under death by disease and not death by starvation. So, slow starvation is grossly underreported in India. Now, moving on, see, the government of India is working towards making India a $5 trillion economy by 2024. This is not possible if India does not have a good and healthy human capital. For India to have a good and healthy human capital, hunger and malnutrition should be completely uprooted. So, government must take measures to address this problem. This is all regarding this news article. In this segment, we discussed about Global Hunger Index, who publishes it, how Global Hunger Index is calculated, India's ranking in Global Hunger Index, India's performance over the years, and finally, we ended up discussing some points about slow starvation. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this news article. This news article talks about a law proposed by two US senators. This bill aims to protect the US from the threat of rare earth metal supply disruption. Why? Because for the supply of rare earth elements, the United States is largely dependent on China. See, China has a chokehold on global rare earth element supply. Thus, the bill also aims to encourage domestic production of those elements which will help the United States reduce its import dependency on these metals from China, which stood at 80% in 2019. This is the crux of the news article. So, in this context, let us discuss what are rare earth elements, their applications, their strategic importance, the reason behind Chinese monopoly in this and we will also discuss about Indian rare earth element reserves the important policies taken by India in rare earth element extraction and trade and finally we will see what are all the reforms that India can take in this regard to rare earth elements. Okay, the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. Just go through it. Now let us start our discussion. See, the name rare earth element is itself a misnomer because at the time of their discovery that is in the 18th century, their presence seemed to be scarce and thus the name rare earth elements. But these elements are quite abundant and they exist in many workable deposits throughout the world. Let us see the list of rare earth elements from the periodic table. See, it includes three elements from the group three of periodic table along with the lanthanoid series. Look at the periodic table. The 17 rare earth elements are scandium, yttrium and lanthanum from group three and cerium through lutinium which are called lanthanides. See, the rare earth elements are all metals and the group is often referred to as rare earth metals. Okay. Now, let us see some of its applications. See, the rare earth elements are used in products as simple as lighter flints and it goes up to modern automobiles who are one of the biggest consumers of rare earth products. Then, it is used in electrical sensors, three-way catalytic converters, in prosperous optical displays and even in speakers and headsets. See, when you are purchasing premium headphones, you might have noticed the statement, these headphones contains neodymium magnets. Here, neodymium is a rare earth metal. Also, it is used in polishing of windshield, mirrors and lenses. See, even in refining of gasoline or diesel fuel, rare earth metals are used. And most importantly, they are used in rechargeable battery. With the start of electric vehicle revolution all over the world, the importance of rare earth metals will improve manifold. Okay? And they are used in modern media and communication devices such as cell phones, televisions and computers. Thus the application of rare earth metal goes on. I have given a table containing various applications of rare earth metals. Just go through it. You can expect a statement type question in prelims from this. Okay? So have a good look at it. Now let us go further and discuss the strategic importance of these rare earth metals. Of the 17 rare earth metals, neodymium is arguably the most needed in the world right now. Why? Because electric vehicles cannot function without this and lithium. Note that lithium is mostly found in Bolivia. And lithium is not a rare earth metal. Okay? See, neodymium is also necessary for vibration of cell phones, working of headphones and even for working of wind turbines. This is because for all of them to work, they need to be powered by rare earth permanent magnets. 
which are the most powerful permanent magnets. This neodymium magnets are used here. Okay. In addition to this, rare earth metals play an essential role in our national defense. Rare earth metals like terbium, tritium, and europium are used in night vision goggles, precision guided weapons, communication equipments, GPS equipments, batteries, and key ingredients for making very hard alloys, which are used in armored vehicles and projectiles. Projectile meaning bullets. See, from the discussion so far, we can understand that this rare earth metals are used in everything from batteries to defense equipments. Hence, they are strategically very important. Okay. Now, let us see the reason for Chinese monopoly. See, China began producing notable amount of rare earth oxides in the early 1980s and it became a leading producer in the world in early 1990s. The reason behind this is that the process to obtain rare earth metals is environmentally destructive and the process of refining rare earth oxides produces radioactive waste. So countries around the world have gone away with the refining process. But China has endless expanse of deserts and areas where nobody lives. And coupled with lax environmental laws, China steadily strengthened its hold on world rare earth oxide market. Another reason is China's low selling price which could not be competed even by the mountain pass mine which is the only integrated rare earth mining and processing site in North America. See, some mines even stopped their operation due to China's low selling price. Thus China gained a monopoly in this rare earth metal market using which it could punish any country by controlling the supply of rare earth metals. But this monopoly of China was realized by the world only in 2010. When China stopped its supply of rare earths to Japan after a Chinese fishing boat was arrested near the disputed Shinkaku Islands. Further, China imposed restriction on exports of rare earth metals in the very same year, thereby pushing up the prices of these metals by 9 times. This is how China is controlling the global market with these rare earth metals. Okay, now let us see some important points about rare earth element deposits and resource. Rare earth element deposits can be classified into three types. They are primary deposit, example being carbonatite associated deposit. Then there are secondary deposits, which include marine placer deposits. And finally, there is industrial process residues. This includes coal fly ash. We need not go deep into this. Instead, let us learn about Indian reserves of rare earth metals through this Indian map. See, in general, they occur in pigmatite belt of Rajasthan, Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. They occur in carbonate complex in Gujarat also. Also, they are found in riverine placers of central India. See, in the global level, the major rare earth element deposits are in China and in the United States of America. See, as of 2018, China had 44 million tons of rare earth deposits and US had 1.4 million tons. In addition to these countries, the major rare earth element producers are India, Australia, Brazil and Malaysia. Now let us see the producers and explorers of these metals in India. Indian Rare Earths Limited under the Department of Atomic Energy is involved in processing of monocyte for the production of various rare earth compounds since 1952. The rare earth elements available in monocyte comprises basically of the lighter fraction. The technology for producing rare earths from monocyte and that of producing pure rare earth of high purity is available with the Indian Rare Earth Limited. Note that mining of beach sand is carried out by Indian Rare Earth Limited and KMML which is a Kerala state government undertaking. Okay. Now let us see few important policy taken by India in this regard. First is the Atomic Minerals Concession Rules 2016. See, these rules were amended to reserve all beach sand mines deposit containing more than 0.75% monocyte in the total heavy minerals for government-owned corporations. Second is the Foreign Trade Policy 2015-2020. to This policy allowed for free import of ores and concentrates of rare earth metals and rare earth oxide. Third is the Broomfield expansion of OSCOM unit. See, OSCOM or Orissa Sand Complex is one of the Indian Rare Earth Limited's flagship unit located at Chattarpur in the district of Ganjam, Odisha. At present, beach sand mining and mineral separation activity are carried out by OSCOM. 
it focuses on extraction of eliminite and other associated metals like rutile zircon silimanite and garnet see all these policies helps in enhancing the extraction and trade of rare earth metals lastly let us see the reforms that india has planned to take in this rare earth metal extraction and utilization see india had firstly planned for specific and high precision laboratory field studies to help ore localization secondly india has intensified exploration efforts in targeted areas by detailed survey and exploratory drilling thirdly india has planned for phase wise exploratory drilling and laboratory analysis of potential blocks in hard rock terrain that is in ambadongar carbonatite complex in gujarat Fourthly India has planned for identification of potential beach sand placer deposit for exploration up to the depth of 50 meter utilizing sonic drilling to augment additional beach sand heavy metal resources in addition India has planned for systematic general exploration of shoreline along the coastal stretches of Odisha Andhra Pradesh Tamil Nadu and Kerala see all these exploration inputs are likely to augment the monocyte resources in quaternary deposit thus by taking all these reform along with foreign companies association india's natural wealth can be changed into our country's strategic assets this is all about this news article and the discussion see in this discussion or in this segment we saw what are rare earth elements their application their strategic importance the reason behind chinese monopoly indian rare earth metal reserves indian producers and explorers of rare earth metals and important policies taken by india in rare earth metal extraction and trade and finally we saw what are all the reforms that india has planned in this regard okay with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article this news article talks about the applications seeking gi tag for two famous products from tamil nadu what are they they are kumbagolam vetrilai and thuvalai manikam malai so in this context let us learn some basic information about gi tag and we will also cover the information given in this news article now let us start our discussion what is a geographical indication it is a indication to identify agricultural natural or manufactured goods that originate from different geographical territory see the manufactured goods should be produced or processed or prepared in that territory and it should have a special quality or reputation or other characteristics some of the examples of registered indian geographical indications are darjeeling tea tirupati laddu kangra paintings nagpur orange kashmir pashmina etc so when a product has a gi tag it conveys an assurance of quality and distinctiveness which is essentially attributable to the place of its origin see gi tags are not only part of a rich culture and collective intellectual heritage but they also supplement the incomes of our rural farmers weavers artisans and craftsmen across the country note that this geographical indications are covered as a element of intellectual property rights under the paris convention for the protection of industrial property they are also covered under trade related aspects of intellectual property rights that is trips agreement which are part of the agreement concluding the uruguay part of gat negotiations now let us see few important information mentioned in the news article the ga or the geographical indication application for kumbagonam vetrilai was filed by the tamil nadu agricultural university in coimbatore whereas the geographical indication application for thuvalai manikamalai was given by the thuvalai manikamalai kaivinai kalaignargal nalasangam in kanyakumari geographical indication application is made for kumbagonam betel leaves for its heart shaped appearance these betel leaves are grown by small and marginal farmers in the kaveri delta region to be particular it is grown in ayambetai rajagiri pandaravadai and swamivalai in tanjavur districts now what about this thuvalai manikamalai see it is a special type of garland made only in thuvalai which is a small village in kanyakumari see the flowers in this garland are positioned which when folded looks like a gem the flowers are generally arranged in five rows but at times for other decorations 20 rows are also used the height ranges from 1 foot to 24 feet and above and the key materials are chamba fiber 
nochi leaves, oleander and rose flowers. See the Tuvali village is famous for its abundance of flowers and most of the flowers for this garland are sourced locally. Note that the technique for Manikamalai was invented by Palani Pandaram as per the details in the GI application. Okay, this is all regarding the news article. In this segment, we saw some basic points about geographical indications, Kumbhagonam Vetrilai and Tuvalai Manika Malai. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article. This is the last article we will be discussing today. This news article is with reference to the Enforcement Directorate. The Enforcement Directorate or ED has attached assets worth 42 lakh rupees of a freelance journalist named Raju Sharma. That said journalist is said to have revealed confidential and sensitive information to Chinese intelligence officers in exchange for remunerations. This is the context of this news article. So with this we will learn about Enforcement Directorate in prelims perspective. See the Enforcement Directorate or ED is a law enforcement agency and a economic intelligence agency responsible for enforcing economic laws and fighting economic crime in India. It is a specialized financial investigation agency under the Department of Revenue Ministry of Finance okay, which enforces the following laws. The first law it enforces is the Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999. It is a civil law. The officers are empowered to conduct investigations into suspected violations of the foreign exchange law and regulation. The Enforcement Directorate can also impose penalties on those who have violated the law. The second law is Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. It is a criminal law. Here, the officers are empowered to provisionally attach or confiscate the assets and to arrest and prosecute the offenders found to be involved in money laundering. Now, some basic facts about Enforcement Directorate. See, the Enforcement Directorate was established in the year 1956 with its headquarters at New Delhi. It is headed by the Director of Enforcement. Besides directly recruiting personnel, the Directorate also draws officers from different investigating agencies like Customs and Central Excise, Income Tax, Police, etc. On Deputation, there are five regional officers for Enforcement Directorate. They are at Mumbai, Chennai, Chandigarh, Kolkata and Delhi and these regional offices are headed by special directors of enforcement. As we have seen, it is responsible for enforcement of Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999 and certain provisions under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Now, you can have a look at some of the other function of enforcement directorate here. Go through these functions carefully. That's all regarding this article. In this discussion, we saw about the Enforcement Directorate and the functions of Enforcement Directorate. With this, let us conclude the news article discussion session. Now, let us take up the practice prelims question. Look at the first practice prelims question. This question is about geographical indication tag. We have to find the incorrect statements. Okay. Let us take up the first statement. The Kumbhagonam beetle leaves recently got the GA tag. See, this statement is incorrect because GI application is only made for Kumbhagonam beetle leaves. GI tag is not yet given. So, the first statement is incorrect. Now, let us take up the second statement. GI tag is given only for agricultural and natural products. See, this statement is also incorrect because from our discussion, we saw that GI tag is given for agricultural, natural and also manufactured products. An example for a manufactured product that has received a GI tag is Dindical Lock. So, since both the statements are incorrect, the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Now moving on to the second question. This question is about Enforcement Directorate. Here also two statements are given. We have to find the incorrect statement. Let us take up the first statement. Directorate of Enforcement is mandated with the task of enforcing the provisions of Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999 and Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. See, this statement is correct because from our discussion we saw that the Enforcement Directorate works on enforcing the provisions of Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999 and Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Now, let us take up the second statement. It works under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. See, this statement is wrong because the Enforcement Directorate works under the Department of Revenue which is under Ministry of Finance. So, the first statement is correct. The second statement is incorrect. 
Since the question asks us to find the incorrect statement, the correct answer is option B, 2 only. Now moving on to the third question. This question is in regards to the recent Global Hunger Index 2021. Two statements are given, we have to find the correct statement. Let's take up the first statement. India ranks 110th in the Global Hunger Index 2021. See, this statement is incorrect because we saw in our discussion that in the 2021 Global Hunger Index, India ranks 101st out of the 116 countries with a score of 27.5 and India has a level of hunger that is in the serious category. Now let us take up the second statement. The value of the GI score is arrived at by using three indicators which includes food supply, undernutrition and child mortality. See this statement is also incorrect because for each country the global hunger index values are determined using four indicators. They are undernourishment, child wasting, child stunting and child mortality. Here child wasting and child stunting are grouped under the dimension called child undernutrition. So since both statement 1 and statement 2 are incorrect, the correct answer here is option D, neither 1 nor 2. Now let us take up the last practice prelims question. This question is about rare earth metals. Here they are asking us to find the correct statements. Let us take up the first statement. Lanthanoid and actinoid series comes under rare earth metals. See this statement is wrong because from our discussion we saw that only lanthanoid series comes under rare earth metals. In addition to the elements in the lanthanoid series, scandium, yttrium and lanthanum are also rare earth metals. Now let us take up the second statement. India is the leading producer of rare earth metal for the past 5 years. This statement is also completely wrong because from our discussion we saw that China is the leading producer with 44 million ton as of 2018. Okay, so since both the statements are incorrect, the correct answer is option D, neither one nor two. The mains question based on today's discussion is displayed here. Write your answers and post it in the comment section. If you like today's session, like, comment and share it with your friends. And for more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankara Ace Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.